Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I pray that the Lord's peace be on you and us here today. God is awesome. He's worthy of all praise. We know that he is coming soon to take his children home. I look forward to that day. But sometimes as Christians, as we pray, as we seek the Lord, we don't have an answer. Today's sermon title is When God is Silent. Have you ever brought a petition to the Lord and for sure you know what his answer is, but you want to bring that petition to him and you ask the Lord, Lord, this is what I need. And then instead of receiving an immediate answer, the Lord is silent in your life. Has that happened to anybody? You're asking God to clarify something and he's just silent. You're asking God to help you with a sickness and he is silent. You ask God to cure you of a disease and God is silent. What happens when God is silent? Whenever we come to Jesus, we expect an immediate answer. We expect for him to answer, and most of the time, our petitions are directed in such a way that we know that the answer will be yes, right? Like, God, I know you love me. Will you please give me this? Please give me that. The kids play the same trick on us. Uh, my daughter the other day comes and tells me, Daddy, I love you. I said, what do you want? And sure enough, uh, can I have some money? <laughs> you're only eight and you're asking for money. So I, I don't understand. But, but it, we, we treat God in the same way and we expect him to answer in the same way towards us. So... Today we're going to focus a little bit on the book of Luke. I'm going to actually talk about the story of John. How many remember the story of John? John the Baptist, he was one of those awesome guys. Uh, but the story doesn't start there. We'll see his relationship between him and, and, and Jesus. Um, and actually, there was a time period that... Um, that that Jesus was about to be born. So if you go back to the book of Matthew, you'll see the interesting story there of how Jesus came about. There was a young girl named Mary. And Mary was uh, early age. Uh, um, it is guesstimated she was in her teen years or a little bit up, you know, young anyways. And then all of a sudden she goes and she's by herself and she has this vision of God. And an angel comes and appears to her and tells her, uh, 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 Mary, you're going to have a baby. And she's all you know, beside herself seeing this uh, a vision of this angel. And, and, and as she's contemplating it, this angel talks to her and she tells uh, he tells her that uh, of, of her being the favored one, the Messiah is going to be born from her. And, and so she's like, wow, that is some good stuff. And then all of a sudden the angel disappears. And she runs into the room. Mom, dad, guess what? I am pregnant. Wait, that didn't go so well. Mommy and daddy, they're like, what? What's going on? Oh, you see, the angel told me, and, and I'm sure she had a struggle in trying to relate that message back and forth. Uh, and as she was trying to relate that message to her parents, he tried to tell her, no, no, you, you've got to understand, the angel told me these things would happen. And, and, and uh, for sure, there was some awkward moments there. At the same time, there was in another uh, town, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah was of old age, the Bible says. 
He was so old that it's past that time of having children. But somehow, one day while he was in the temple serving for the Lord, an angel appeared on the right side of the altar, the Bible says, and speaks to Zechariah and says, Yes, we are going to, uh, we're going to answer your prayer. And it's a yes. And he's like, well, what, what, what prayer is that? You will have a child. And, and he's like, well, are you sure that we're going to have a baby? And, and yes, because you doubt it, you're not going to be able to speak anymore until the child is born. I mean, what kind of a, a message was that? And, and they were waiting for Zechariah to come out. And, and sure enough, he came out of the temple and everybody's expecting him to, to be able to proclaim that all sins are forgiven, that he's gone in there and, and maybe he has seen a vision from the Lord and, and he's going to come and tell the vision to everybody. But he can't speak. He's quiet. Now, sisters, how many would love that from your husbands? Don't raise your hands. All of a sudden, this man cannot speak, and he's not able to speak all over until nine months later on when Elizabeth has their first son, and they name him John. Well, God in this family produced a miracle. Mary and Elizabeth were cousins, and and Jesus and John made them cousins as well. And so, yes, they were both having children roughly during the same time period. Uh, Mary a little bit sooner than Elizabeth. But they didn't grow up together. But John had always heard of the miraculous story of his mom's cousin, Mary. John had heard that an angel had visited and he had heard from his parents in the, way, the same way how an angel appeared to his mom and said that he, she was going to have a baby boy and he was going to prepare the way for the Messiah, the one that they were waiting for. So let's turn our Bibles over to Luke chapter 3. John grows up. He takes his... Calling serious. And the Bible says in John, uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 3, it says, And he went into all the region, talking about John, around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. And it is written in the book, of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying, A voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain will be brought low. The crooked place shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And sure enough, John was out there and he was preaching up a storm and everybody in the region used to come about to listen to John preach. And as he was preaching, he was preaching about make his way straight. He was preaching reformation. How many would love that? Let's talk about reformation and revival. And boy, he was preaching it. And he didn't let no stone unturned. He went about and he was preaching the gospel straight out how it should be. He was talking to the people and for sure from this preaching, they would come out to Wednesday night prayer meeting for sure. For sure they would come out and they'd start attending Sabbath school early in the morning on Sabbath morning. For sure his preaching would make people stop arguing and fussing and, and they would just get along. And he was preaching it. And his church, the, the group started growing and growing. And people from all over the area started coming to listen to the preaching of John the Baptist. And one day, as he was preaching, baptizing, all of a sudden he stops as the Holy Spirit impresses him. And he looks up. And here he comes. Jesus, the one slain from the foundation of the world. And as he comes towards John, John looks in admiration. 
this is the guy I've been preparing everything for. And as Jesus comes near, he asks for baptism. And, and John is like, no way. I need to be baptized by you. That baptism, Jesus replies, this needs to be done. He did it for an example for us all. And as soon as Jesus went into the water and he came up out of the water, the heavens kind of opened up and you heard a big voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And not only did the voice come out of heaven, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit descended and it landed on Jesus in the form of a dove. And John just looked on with admiration. This is the Messiah. He heard the voice. Hmm. Jesus comes up out of the water, walks away. And John is just beside himself. A little bit later on, the disciples... Jesus had his disciples. John had his disciples. And the church members from one church and the church members from the other church started arguing together of which church was better than the other. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about, right? And so they were talking about, well, which one has a better worship service? No, well, which one has a better Sabbath school? Which one has, you know, they started arguing between one group and the other. And then, uh, well, Jesus' disciples are baptizing more than us. And John has to set the story straight. And I love the way he just brings it about. He just says a simple one-liner and he straightens everything up. How, how many think it's worth to look at? Yeah. yeah, okay. Let's go over to John chapter 3, verse 30. John 3, verse 30. The one-liner... That should be in the lips of all Christians. Here it is. When they're discussing and they're arguing about which group is better or wh who's doing what. It, it, it was very simple for John. He, he goes over there in John chapter 3 verse 30. And he says, he must increase and I must decrease. And that's all the answers that we have for anybody that asks us about Jesus. If Jesus be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. It's lifting him up and me down. It's not that I am any good. It's not that I am perfect. It's not that I do this or do that. No, no, no. It's him and it always has been him. He must increase and I must decrease. Do you know what it means to decrease in Jesus Christ? Do you know what it means to strangely fade away until you completely reflect Jesus? You know how hard it is to try to reflect Jesus and keep your own ways of being? Oh, that's tough, isn't it? Well, I am who I am. Well, that's what you need to give up, right? How, how many have... Habits, you know you have habits, and, and you know some of these habits that we have are kind of quirky habits, and oh, that's just who I am. Well, uh, you need to be less like you and more like Jesus. And Jesus must increase, and I must decrease. And John knew it, and he said, hey, guys, I know you guys are arguing here, but you know what? Bottom line is, I don't care what God called me to do or who I am. Or, or, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is that he increases and I decrease every day. Boy, it put a different spin to the argument there. John continued preaching. He sure did. And as he was preaching, started preaching against the king. He was preaching up a storm. And sure enough, Herod had him thrown in jail. And this is where we get our scripture reading today from John. And then uh, we actually read in Luke. Luke chapter 7 picks up the story. Let's turn our Bibles there. Luke chapter 7, verse 19 and forward. 
We can start at verse 18. When you're doing the gospel and you end up in an uncomfortable place, you pray to God and you expect an answer from God. And I'm sure that while John was in jail, the first thing he thought is like, I've got this made. My cousin, excuse me, my cousin, he is the Messiah. My cousin, I heard the voice from heaven. My cousin, yes, the Holy Spirit came down upon Mary. My cousin's got my back. I'm in jail. I'll be here for a bit. But you just wait and see because I must decrease and he must increase. And therefore, he's going to come. He's going to rescue me. And as he sat in jail, days started passing by. Months started passing by. And John started getting discouraged about a unanswered prayer. Y'all don't hear me today. When the Christian sits there and they struggle with something in life and they think that God has turned their backs on him, that is when God is silent. What is really happening out there? We see that John has entered this mindset in verse 18 of Luke chapter 7. It says, Then the disciples of John reported to him according to all these things, What things? All the things that Jesus was doing. John, you should see the Messiah out there. Your cousin, yes, he's healing the sick. I saw it with my own eyes. And John, okay, yes, good. But but, but what about me? Mm. We hear those mission reports, good things happening in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, in different places where churches are booming. But what about us? Lord? Verse 19 says, And John calling two of his disciples to him, he sent them to Jesus saying, Are you the one or do we look for another? Come on, we've been waiting for you, Jesus. Call those two disciples. Okay, guys, uh, we heard the reports now. Please, uh, go to Jesus. Are you the one we're waiting for? Are you really the Messiah? Or do we look for another? Because I've been here in jail. I haven't had an answered prayer. Then when the men came to him, to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? And that very hour, he cured many infirmities and afflictions and evil spirits and many blind, he gave sight. Jesus didn't even answer the disciples. The disciples came, Jesus, are you the one? And Jesus just started healing people. Started doing what he has been doing. Just healing people and just doing things. Doing miracle after miracle after miracle. And the disciples were just looking at Jesus and wondering, wait a minute. We see these miracles, but what about John? John is in jail. At this point, after he had spent that time doing his duty... Jesus answers and said to them in verse 22, Go tell John all the things that you have seen and heard. That the blinds see, that the lame they walk, that the lepers are cleansed, that the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. So we think about it and we see those verses. Wait, wait a minute. Now Jesus corrects him and he says, look, we, and I don't know what miracle he did, but he actually raised people from the dead at that moment. And John is still in jail. And he tells them, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. You know, there's comes times that we question God. We question God why we are in the situation we are in. We expect the immediate answer, 
But sometimes God is quiet. We remember the story of Elisha, uh, of Elijah, how, how when he was running away from Jezebel, he wanted God to answer him. And, and there was a big fire and there was an earthquake and there was a big fierce wind and God was not there. He had to wait until the still small voice. We remember how Moses, Moses was out there and, and Moses didn't want to go and, and help deliver the children of Israel. He said, no, God, send somebody else. Why have you picked me? Oh, if we could just see this uh, big picture unravel in front of us. If our eyes, the veils of our eyes could be open and we could see why things happen the way they do, we wouldn't question so much God. I think of the story of Job. Job was a faithful man. Read Job chapter 1. Everything was taken away from him. And if you notice in Job chapter 1, it wasn't that the enemy came and says, hey, I want to take everything away from Job. Who suggested for it to be Job? God suggested, God was going through the resumes and he, oh, here's a good one. Job, have you considered my servant Job? Do you think that sometimes in our trials, in our tribulations, maybe God is considering us so that we could be a spectacle to the universe where the universe is actually looking at you and at me well, as we struggle through that problem, through that situation, and we're questioning God, and God says, I have chosen you to go through this trial, this tribulation. Mm. And we're praying for deliverance, and God is silent. How many nights did Job not go to bed just praying God for deliverance from his pain and from his illness. How many times did Job not pray that somehow he would find some sort of relief? And when his friends showed up, he saw for sure my friends will bring me good news of encouragement. <laughs> Y'all don't hear me. Whenever things go bad and we want relief from God and God don't answer, our friends are pretty much the same way as Job's friends. For sure, you must have some sort of sin in your life. Yep, you did something wrong. Yep, that's what you get for eating wrong all those years, right? <laughs> we won't, no, we're not going to go there today. You know, but sometimes when God is silent, we do question God. And not always does God answer in a positive way. But we don't know the big picture of why God is being silent in our lives you see what if Jezebel did catch Elisha what if the Red Sea did not part for Moses what if Jesus at the last moment would have said no to Calvary mm. It's not always a yes. As I, I, I've been going through the, uh, through the great controversy again, I've been going chapter through chapter, and I see that not everybody got a free pass. On the contrary, the Reformation, as these re reformers, they would bring the light, it would put them in pearl, and most of them, most of them died a horrible death, and they were wishing for a deliverance. They were praying, and God was silent. As we look at the Roman Colosseum, how they used to fill it up with Christians and let the lions go in there and devour them. And they used to bet to see which Christian would last the longest. They were praying for deliverance. I'm sure the story of Daniel played through their minds many times. Hey, the lions are coming. Let's be like Daniel. Maybe the Lord will deliver me. And the Lord was silent. What happens when the Lord is silent? Jesus, later on in that same chapter, if you want to look at verse 28 of chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, verse 28, Jesus reassures who John the Baptist is. And he says in verse 28, For I say to you, 
Among those who are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. There's no greater than John the Baptist. And he is in jail hoping for an answer from God. You know, John the Baptist, as he's in jail, Herodias wants him dead. Herod is scared to kill him. Herod goes, the Bible says that he has a party. And in that party, they actually drink too much. And as they are drinking, uh, uh, there comes Herodias' daughter, and she dances in front of the king. And as she is dancing, he gets so excited from the dance uh, that he promises her even up to half the kingdom. And so she doesn't know what to ask for. So this daughter, she runs to her mama. Mama, what do I ask for? And the mama says, I want the head of John the Baptist. We could see the enemy working towards this goal of silencing this preacher. And as he goes... She requests this petition, and Herod has no choice. He goes and he sends, and there they come. And John the Baptist, I'm sure he's still praying for deliverance. And as he's kneeling there and praying, the gates are opened wide at the jailhouse. And in comes the jailkeeper. He grabs John, and John may be thinking, yes, I am delivered. And as he gets up to walk out, he notices that with him goes an axeman. And instead of being delivered out into the freedom, he is taken over to a wood chopping block. And he kind of figures out what's going to happen. And the Bible says that they brought the head to Herod. You know, not every story finishes fine. Not every experience is going to be a mountaintop experience. How, how many have figured that one out already? It is kind of like, yeah, pastor, we know that. It's called life. It's called life when things happen and you like hit rock bottom. and like, wow, that one hurt. Then you think you're finally getting over it and something else comes up. On this side of heaven, that's life. While sin reigns on this earth, that is what's going to happen. Oh, I read a sad news the other day. It's happening over in Africa as, as in one of those countries. They're bringing refugees and they're letting them go out in the desert. And they have over a 20-mile stretch to walk to the nearest town. And there's a bunch of refugees trying to make it to the nearest town with no water, no food, having to walk over 20 miles in 120-degree weather. I'm thinking to myself, man, and I complain? Mm. You know, we are blessed. Yeah. I don't care how low your low is. Your low is much higher than other people's yeah. lows. You know, as we think about John the Baptist, him losing his life, we think about the reformers, on the things they went through. There is no room to question God. There really isn't. He knows what's best. He knows what's happening in our life. And there's an attitude to adopt as Christians. How many know what an attitude is? How many have teenagers? So you know what attitude is. You know... I don't know where my daughter gets her attitude, my oldest daughter. But eh, I say she gets it from mama. <laughs> mama doesn't appreciate me saying that either. But, you know, it, it, she, at an early age, they learn attitude. But, but what if we were to gain an attitude for Jesus? 
The same attitude that Job had when they kept trying to convince him that he had done wrong and, and that there's something's wrong with you. You must have sinned, you know. The God in heaven doesn't do injustice. His, this is justice being played out in your life. There must be some secret sin. And then Job was like, no, I've been faithful to him and I'll remain faithful. And he also says that though he slay me, yet will I trust him. As to have that attitude for Christ, that I don't care how low the enemy throws me down. I don't, know what, I don't care what sickness he places on me. I don't care how financially broke I get. I will be faithful to my God. Oh, let's turn our Bibles over to Romans. This is good. Romans chapter 8. This is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It gives us hope. Romans chapter 8. You'll get used to this one. Romans chapter 8, the last few verses. Uh, Paul is all... Uh, uh, is preaching here to the Romans and, and he, he's talking about uh, separation from God's love and, and he's trying to play this up and he, he's finishing up this, this chapter in such an eloquent way as he speaks about God's love and he says in verse 35, I, I want you to check this out. Verse 35 says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He makes that question, is there anybody that will separate you from the love of Christ? The answer we know is what? No. But can something separate God from you? Can you leave the love of Christ? Yes. But Christ's love for you can never be separated. Who shall separate us from that love of Christ? And then he says right there, he makes the list of the worst stuff. He says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword well, what is it going to take oh many times when we receive those bad news about an unemployment and yeah we're going to pass hunger we're not going to have clothes that's it I'm not going to church no more no God didn't bless me or sometimes we get those persecution and sometimes persecution even comes from the inside right and oh, well, that's it I'm not going no more and sometimes we face those hard points in life and we say, nope, we are no longer, uh, we're, we're going to separate ourselves from God. And God says, no, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or all these bad things? No, we know it's not. Verse 37 says, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded. This is, this is Paul speaking here. I, I, I am convinced I am persuaded, he says, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing shall be able to separate you from the love of God. Not even death itself. Yes, because if we die with Christ, we have the blessed hope. We've got it won. I don't know about you guys. This is one of the reasons why Paul, when they came and they talked to him about killing him and everything, he said, oh, go ahead, take me. I am ready to go. <laughs> oh, he was ready. He said, man, the next time I open my eyes, I'm going to see Jesus. Boy, you almost become invincible with that. Nobody can touch you then. Woo. Talk about having superpowers, right? <laughs> you know, Jesus, nothing can separate you from his love. And sometimes when we pass through the difficult things in life, we got to remember that he still loves us. Sometimes he's trying to mold our characters, right? Sometimes he wants us to be a spectacle to the universe. Sometimes we're being a witness and we don't even know we're being a witness, maybe not to our fellow human beings, but to the universe. Sometimes we're, when we're on the down low, we're being a witness against the enemy as well. When God is silent, what do we do? We keep worshiping him. We keep praising him. We keep calling on him. And we keep going towards him because he's the only one that can, he, he's got it taken care of. Maybe not on this earth, but in the new earth. He's got it already figured out. He's got it all taken care of. 
There's nothing that can separate us from his love. You know, church, when Jesus comes back, it's going to be two group of people, two of them only. Those who gave it their all for Jesus and for those that didn't care. What do I mean? You've got to have that attitude for Jesus. Thick or thin, we're going to stick close to Jesus. Doesn't matter how crazy life gets, we'll stay close to him. We can't go halfway. You'll never make it. We can't say, yes, I will be a Seventh-day Adventist on the seventh day of the week. We've got to be a Christian all week long. If we're praising Jesus every day of the week, then we can gather today and we can praise the Lord together. If you haven't praised him all week, oh, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Praise him in the morning. Praise him at noon. Praise him at night. May he be the first thought every morning. May he be the last thought before you go to bed. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I want to just thank you because you are the all-powerful, awesome, all-knowing, omnipotent God. And you love us. Father, Sometimes we don't know what's going on, but we trust you. So be in our hearts. Take control of everything. May it all be for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us see.